So we've got an evening of talk about uh, testing on mobile devices, and uh, I won't waffle on about it too much. I'll hand over to our first speaker. Um, this is uh, Raj RJ. Uh, he is the, uh, the director of the Interaction Lab, which is a consultancy which runs out of the City University in London. The lab carries out traditional testing, uh, as well as testing on uh, new platforms, uh, one of which is mobile. So without further ado, Here's Raj. What I'm going to talk about in uh, the next 20 minutes is a bit of background on mobile user testing. And then I'm going to go through some of the current setups that we have um, in mobile testing uh, at, at the Interaction Lab. And also some other tools um, that are available for, for anyone that wants to get into that, that, line, of, uh, that line of work. Um, then I've got a uh, setup that you can get all together for under, under £50. Um, there's links to various pieces of software that you can use to mash together your own, your own setup. So I've got, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to finally talk a bit about um, what other developments there are in mobile testing. A lot of the people in this room obviously know why mobile testing is really important. Um, if you're ever in a situation with a client that really doesn't understand, then you could throw this stat that recently came out. If you take the sales that Apple made in Q1 for the new iPhone 4S, that actually is more than the amount of babies that were born worldwide in that same time period. So it's a rapidly growing um, area, and that's just Apple. So um, there's, there's more of a tendency to take a lot more um, emphasis and um, more research under mobile applications themselves, not only applications, even websites. How well is a website going to work on a tablet? Um, sometimes companies aren't sure whether to go for an application or go for a website. And conducting mobile user testing can help understand what is the best approach to take. Then the next dilemma you have, are you going to do lab testing or are you going to do testing in the field? Um, ideally, you want to have a bit of a mix. Um, if your budget allows for this, again, this is depends on the clients that you're working with, uh, depends on how much budget they have, depends on how much time they have um, on there. So traditionally, you've got the setup in the usability lab, so you've got the one-way mirror behind, where, behind which the client's normally tearing their hair out because it's not working as it should do. Um, and then you've also got the client, that's the, the participant that's being talked through the testing with the facilitator. There's various different ways that you could do testing in the field. Now this is actually from a research study um, where they followed this dude around um, just the streets of Denmark. I mean, the lady in red is being very inconspicuous, you know, she's kind of in the background, she's trying to anyway. <laughs> it's, it's not practical. Um, so there's, there's different approaches that you can take, different ways that you might be able to tackle this situation. Um, and in fact in this study what they found were that people were actually crossing the street because they saw what was going on and they didn't really want to be a part of it. So, you need to make it as natural as possible, and there's different approaches that you can, can, you, that you can do for that. Again, that same study also were looking at doing usability testing in a lab, but trying to mix some of the field-like situations, scenarios. So they had um, this guy on a treadmill who was doing a think lab while he was doing some applications. I don't know how practical this is. Um, what they actually found was that um, he was doing a think aloud which was placing higher cognitive load on, on him while he was doing the tasks themselves, while he was doing the treadmill and also working through the application. So it's not natural. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's trying, they're trying to simulate as much as they can the external environment, but I think there's, there's, there's different ways of approaching it. So being a presentation from a university, I have to throw in some slides about academic research. So there's a nice um, link here for you know, the paper if you really want to go and find out a bit more about it. And the slides are going to be uploaded um, to the website, I think, later on. So now I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about mobile hardware that we have in the Interaction Lab. One of the things that we have is the Elmo Visualizer. So this costs between 200 to £300, pounds, which is quite expensive. Um, and the way that it works 
So this, the, they actually used to use Elmo visualizers, well they do use them in the lecture theatres uh, within the university. Um, going past one of the rooms I thought that that might be useful for mobile testing, so I just took one. Um, and then put it into the lab. Um, and it worked really well because you've got various different types of outputs. And you can plug it into um, a PC via VGA, or you can plug it in to, to a Mac or a PC using USB. And you can just show that onto the screen, capture the screen, and also have another camera picking the user's face up. The pros with this is you get a high quality image, and you also have functionality to zoom both on the device itself and also there's another control application that you can use. So there's an application that works with the, with the USB driver and you can zoom remotely from that. The cons of this are that participants will move out of the capture area. We were doing testing on a game and when they were getting more and more excited, the game, the mobile phone was coming closer and closer towards them. And we had to literally just say, we need to move forward, you need to move forward. So, you know, there are certain things that will, will arise which need to be taken into consideration. Sometimes you do get frames that are dropped because um, even the most powerful screen recording softwares will drop frames because this is, this is capturing out. I think the frame rate for the um, Elmo is about 20 frames per second and the maximum that you get is about 15. So when you're playing that back, it might be a bit jittery. So things like that also need to be considered <coughs> if you're going to be looking to present back to a client, for example. Then you've got the movie. Um, camcorders, I was, I'm ashamed I couldn't bring these along, but they're about this, this size. Um, and you can just wear them around a chain um, and literally have you know, a phone in front of you and going through um, an application and do, doing testing like that. They have, we have tried to use it in the field as well. Um, it's not that great because we, were just, we had it tied onto a chain and it wasn't allowing, it kept moving around so you just get like side images. So you wouldn't get full on what was going on like directly in front of the, of the person that has been using the application. Um, the sound quality on these isn't really great. So what I would suggest is if you're looking to do anything with these kinds of um, devices, then potentially have this as um, something to augment or su supplement the traditional um, other ways that you're capturing the data. Then you've got Toby, um, who make a, a mobile testing stand this is again two to three hundred pounds. So I mean, a lot of these are quite expensive, um, but with this one, it's a bit more robust. Um, it's kind of fixed, so there's also pros and cons with how natural that is, whether that's really going to simulate, you know, how it's going to be used in the field. And going back to the study um, that I mentioned earlier, in terms of what they did, is they compared doing uh, research in the field, research in the lab with the treadmills, and also just testing in this kind of situation. And they found when they did testing where it's a fixed position, they found the most issues. But they also found a lot of cosmetic and aesthetic issues. So it depends on you know, what kinds of um, issues that you're really looking for, what your approach is trying to be, and then you can decide what, you know, what setup works best for you. And again, considering budget, time, and various other factors. Mr. Tappy. So um, this is a device that I really want to get. Um, but as you can see, I've got quite a lot of collection of things. And running out of money now, so um, this is on my to-buy to, to list. Um, so it's a contraption that just literally sits. So you mount your iPad or your iPhone onto the base of the unit, and then there's a camera that hangs over and just captures everything that's happening on the screen. And it, from the video that they have on the website, it seems to re work really nicely. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're considering doing uh, testing where you want there to be a bit more flexibility, then this probably is um, something that you might want to consider looking at. So now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, mobile testing software. So I've talked a little bit about you know, what kinds of hardware um, connections that you can make. Um, now I'm going to talk about some of the setups that you can have on the software side. So there's Moray. Is everyone familiar with Moray? A few of you are, most of you are, okay. Um, Moray, we use a lot of Moray, Moray testing for our des desktop-based testing. But we're also starting to introduce it for, for mobile usability testing. The good thing about Moray is you can log everything, um, which makes it really good if you have the luxury of having another person that can be uh, moderating the testing sessions. So here you've got quotes, errors, user need help, <coughs> observations. You can even add your own markers in, so if there's a user that's made a positive comment, then you can automatically timestamp that onto the list. Um, and then when you're going through the findings and you're analysing the results, it makes it a lot more easier because then you can just highlight all of the issues that you've claimed were or you stated were a high priority, 
and then you can go through and you know as a group discuss how how is this issue um, a hindrance for the task that was being conducted. So it works very well in that, that kind of a that kind of a situation. Um, another good thing about it is you can do uh, testing streaming. So you could have a client in another room, and with Mora you can stream the testing over the network. So it's quite good um, for that kind of a setup. And again, you've got the metrics gathering. So while you're logging all of the issues, you're also logging the tasks. And you can log how long a user took to undertake a particular task. And across seven users, you can make a comparison and come up with an average of you know, what was the average time for them to find this certain part of the application or you know, find a root user of the TFL application. So the cons with Moray is that the quality isn't great and it's lag prone. Um, so the newest, newest version of Moray, well, some of the newer versions of Moray allow for you to have two forms of input. So you can have two cameras plugged into the back of um, the PC. And that's what you can see here. So one camera is just facing the screen and another one that's capturing um, the user's face. Now, what happens is because of the frame rates, it, it, it can't handle it that well. And I mean, what you see on the screen is really good. But when you're transmitting that over the network, what the client sees in the other room really isn't good and you don't want to upset your clients. Um, so you need to think about what's the best way. I mean, there's various other ways that you can hack around it. Um, but if you're, if you're really looking for, for streaming um, user testing on a mobile device, you, I think it's best testing this out just to see, exploring how, how well it's going to work. And Mori is, is quite expensive. It's about, two, about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. But it's because you have such a great um, set of functionality that you can do with it after that. Is it um, only available on PC as well? Yes, more is only on PC, yeah. Pretty serious con for... Yeah, and that one. <laughs> it's a pretty really serious <laughs> UX people. <laughs> There's also mobile eye tracking. So um, this is using the setup that I showed earlier. So it was a fixed positioning for the uh, mobile phone. So here you literally have the phone and the eye tracker is situated above um, the phone. And what that does is that captures the eye movement. And then you can also have the picture in picture as well on this. Um, so this is great because you get an extra insight. You can see literally where the person is looking while they're undertaking the task. Um, the quality is better than what you'd get with Moray. Um, and again, you can still do metrics gathering from that as well. Um, the cons is there's poor quality on the streaming. So again, with the Moray, because when you're streaming over, the, over a network, it can drop out, um, which it can be an issue, especially if you're having remote observers. So again, that's something else that needs to be considered. It is fiddly. Um, it takes quite a while to set up um, on the instruction manual because the way that you work with this eye track is you're turning the eye tracker upside down um, and you're using it with different angles and playing around with various things. So according to the user manual, it might have issues with people that have long eyelashes, women that wear lots of mascara. So you kind of need to add that into your screener when you're doing your participant recruitment, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a headache. Um, and again, with Toby eye tracking, it's, it's quite expensive because you have to pay for the, the mobile testing stand itself and pay um, for the software um, with the eye tracker, which is about 15, 20, 20,000 pounds. So it's, it's quite expensive. Does anyone know who this guy is? No? This is Heath Robinson. So um, Heath yeah. Robinson's a, a cartoonist illustrator guy. Um, you must have heard the phrase, oh, that's a bit Heath Robinson. So that basically means you know, hacking something together and just <coughs> making it work. This is a phrase that we use a lot because we do that in the lab on a day-to-day -day basis. We just hack together loads of different types of technology. So um, what I'm going to talk about now is some of the setups that you could probably do yourself. So for those of you that have a phone, you could take a capture of that. and. This basically is a list of all of the software tools um, that are what I call the Heath Robinson approach. So one of the things that you use is this um, gooseneck camera, which you can buy from Amazon for about £39. And that camera you can literally put on the desk and bend it around so you can capture the mobile phone screen. And then you have another camera that you obviously face at, uh, you point at the user's face, which can be really good to have that whole picture in picture. Now, obviously, you. If you want to do logging and metrics gathering, more is going to be the best option. But in some situations, you might just want to have a video um, capturing of what's happened. 
So this is an awesome piece of software, free screen to video. And I don't normally trust anything that has free in the title of a software application, but this is really good. Um, and it literally just captures everything on the screen and it's really lightweight. Um, and it takes the sound in as well. So um, that's also another really useful application to use for any testing that you do because it can serve as a really useful backup that you have. Um, and, it's, and as I said, it's lightweight. And then what you, another software that you have is Webcam Viewer. So the way that the setup would work is you'd use Webcam Viewer, which literally just takes whatever output's coming out from each of these cameras and shows it on the screen. So you have Webcam Viewer showing the mobile phone and then another instance of that application showing the user's face and then capture that with this um, screen to video. I might be going a bit fast, but if you have a look at that link, it'll make sense to you. Um, but I mean, un for under 50 pounds, you can have um, quite a good setup for that. So there is a map option as well. <laughs> it's a bit more expensive. Um, so you, with this Mac option, Silverback is probably the best uh, application to use because it allows for you to capture the screen as well as uh, it does allow for you to um, get quite good quality on the desktop as well. So uh, it's the same cam uh, webcam which works on Mac and PC and then obviously the other cam camera didn't work on a Mac so you've got Logitech one which, uh, which is really good. Um, and in this instance, because you don't have an application on the screen, whatever's coming on each of these outputs you use QuickTime, and QuickTime just literally shows the output from one of those screens, and then um, from Silverback you get the user's face captured anyway. So that's another approach. It's worth noting that um, the new uh, version of QuickTime lets you do the screen recording yeah. as well. Exactly, so that's what you would do. So you'd, you'd set it to do screen recording, um, and then you'd, you can set it, you can set another application to show you the output from that webcam. So there's various different ways, but those are the, with those four things you could have a quite good setup. So this is Mac Love. Um, you don't have to always have, you know, loads of different cameras. You could just hug your Mac. And so here he's basically using the camera on the top of his um, laptop. And here this guy's using this iPad camera. So you can get quite cuddly with your Mac if you want to do that kind of testing that's possible as well. Again, again, it depends on your budget. budget. Any kind of testing is better than no testing. So if you can get people to go through the application and record anything that's happening, get a think aloud of that as well. It's really useful. So also now there's more applications that you have for mirroring and what you can see on, the, on your iPad screen or your iPhone screen. So there's two that are available now. So there's Mirror Op, which is on the Android. So that's for any Android phones. And then there's Reflection, which is um, for, for the iPad. Unfortunately, the mirroring option only works with iPhone 4S. Um, but I, if I have time at the end, I can do a quick demo just to give you an idea of how that works. But these are really good because you're not really messing around with loads of different camera setups. The only drawback of this is you can't see if anyone's hovering their finger over trying to make a decision. But if you've encouraged them to do a think aloud, you kind of know what their thought process is while they're going through that task. So it helps you to understand you know, what, they're going, what, what they're thinking while they're understanding, you know, progressing through the various different components of the application or of the website. So uh, just going to talk a bit about physiological mobile testing. So this is taking it to um, more measuring you know, your actual body, bodily responses to mobile testing. So this is the um, Q sensor, which is a device that you wear on your wrist. Um, it measures your galvanic skin response, it measures your um, body temperature, and it measures your movement. So you get quite a good um, further level of insight in terms of, you know, when you're doing mobile testing, you can overlay this onto your mobile testing um, video to, to highlight if there was any certain point where the participants seemed stressed, were there any differences in the physiological responses of that. In the interaction lab, we haven't really made use of this as yet, apart from our internal research. Um, but it's something that we're looking more into um, doing. And this is an example of the kind of output that you get. So you've got, um, here you can see the GDA, and this is the movement. Um, so the movement is in three, three different coordinates. So it can be quite useful to have another layer of insight, if, particularly if you're doing things like games testing, because you know, there's more of an interest to see what other things are going on when people are um, you know, interacting with applications and phones. So basically, this is now mirroring everything that's happening on the iPad. So if you're doing user testing, you could just have someone going through an application. Um, let me think of one. 
But again, it's, it can be a bit frustrating because you can't see... Oh, it's crashed, great. Um, you, can't yeah, see, yeah. you can't see what the person, where their hand is, so it's a bit like you know, what's going on the screen. But it's, it's good to have this as an additional thing. So what I'd probably say is you'd have this in one corner of the screen, and you'd also have another app showing what's happening um, in terms of the, the output from the, the webcams as well. Right, I'm done. Is there any questions? Yeah. Yes. Just going back to the presentation, you were talking about what kind of insights would you be able to gain from So, um, with the physiological testing, I probably envisioned that that would be really useful for gaming um, and also showing if there is any kind of like serious frustration happening. We haven't, as I said, we haven't really looked because that's quite a new piece of equipment that we have. So we're still exploring and seeing how we can fit this in, into testing. But because it gives you the, the skin conductance, which is a quite a good measure of anxiety or arousal, um, it could be quite interesting to match that up with different kinds of um, like your traditional webcam um, input and just see what are the differences. So again, with the eye tracking, it can be seen as quite subjective at the first instance, but it'd be useful to explore how that can be uh, beneficial in user testing, both on you know, applications as well as gaming, as well as websites. There's, there's times as well when, like, especially in gaming, where the users play the game and they, there's no expression on their face at all, but you see a huge spike of the, the arousal level of their, of their skin. And then afterwards you can say, like, what, like, what was it? Were you really annoyed? Were you really excited? Because they both come up as a spike. But it gives you that extra dimension. Yeah. yeah. But it really only does work when you can cross it out in some way. Yeah, so it's... How much is one of those? This one costs about 1,500 pounds. This is why I can't afford Mr. Tucky, because I'm just throwing money at it. Is there any other questions yet? Um, I've not thought about doing Mario in addition to two cameras before. I've got another idea because you get much higher quality. Yes. Um, but um, my worry would be it's quite hard getting the two video feeds captured and making sure the machine don't crash as it is. Does it, does it, will it work? Or are you going to get lots of crashing if you're mirroring as well? As you need to have quite a, I mean, a MacBook Pro should be fine. Should be fine to handle it. Um, you have to whack one another around to get it to work. I don't think that, because basically what the software does is the software basically simulates what Apple, Apple TV does. So mirroring is something that was put for Apple TV. And this software just simulates that and kind of makes the iPad or the iPhone think that this is an Apple TV. So in essence, it's just um, a, a client from the server. So um, we haven't had any major crash issues with it, and we've used it with um, the webcam input as well as you know showing what's happening on the user's face. But it's it's very. What you should do is always have some kind of a backup. Definitely. There's a there's a way with the iPad too when they allow you to stick a VGA cable. Yes. In the iPad, if you prepared to have it tethered to a cable, then you can mirror the screen without the network. Right. Although if you put the cons, then you can put it tethered to a cable. Yeah, so there's things, there's, there's things like that. So it's a bit Yeah. And again, with both of those, you still, you will lose, you will drop some frames, but again, you have better quality, um, and you can see what's, what's going on on the screen a lot more clearer. I, mean, I, quite, I quite like the, the, the use of a visualizer. I think that works quite well. Yes. Problem going out of frames difficult. But if you have what you've used before with yours, where you have a, a camera stuck onto the actual device, when you rotate it, the, the video is now the wrong way around. Yes. So you're having to, if you want to go back and watch a video, you have to Got get that video and rotate it 90 degrees. Yeah. And then you switch it again, you'll rotate it again. And then you'll switch it again, you'll rotate it again. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's, there's, there's loads of different approaches, and I think you just learn by doing with this kind of stuff. So. so, with user testing, it varies on what you're testing. Depends on you know what your target demographic is, what how many different types of users are going to be using the application and the device. Based on that, you can make a decision in terms of how many people from each of those demographics are you going to take. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Like I said earlier. Any testing is better than no testing, and if you're limited to a budget, I'd probably say going for about seven to ten users as a baseline to just get some feedback would be good. Um, but if, if you have constraints on your budget, then you know you need to consider alternative ways um, of doing that. I mean, having a small sample is also really good. Okay. Thank um, you. All right. Um, round of applause for Ryan.
Our next speaker is um, Walt Buchan. Is it Buchan? Yeah. Perfect. Walt is, I wouldn't say veteran, but like, has got a lot of experience, more than 15 years of experience in the field of UX. Um, he's currently uh, Director of User Experience at the preeminent user experience company in Bristol called CX Partners. He designs interactions, documented designs, and researches user experience. And he's come all the way from Bristol to Brighton. Um, to talk to us about DIY handheld device testing. <laughs> I got that right. I didn't get yeah. nervous and say die handheld <laughs> device testing. Die, die, die. die, so, die. <laughs> okay, DIY handheld device testing. Uh, what I want to cover, or what I'll cover in the talk uh, tonight, is sort of two things. One is a uh, is an approach that I've had, a sort of an approach, a approach to how to test mobile devices over the last couple of years, I suppose. Uh, and you'll see some of the sort of the process or the progress I've made through and the things that I've done uh, that have sort of evolved over those two years. Uh, and the other thing, I guess, is the, the, the constraints or the needs of mobile testing, which Raj. Uh, covered as well, but I think there's, I'll sort of touch on those again, uh, and I think there are some, because people have phones and iPads and tablets and all the rest, and they wander around with them, they're weird things, they're not, they're not in labs, uh, and that was one of the first things that struck me, was one of the first things that struck me when I started reading, because I didn't have any kit, I started out with people saying, so what are you going to, we need to test a mobile device. I haven't got anything to test a mobile device with. What the hell am I going to do? Usually we just sit people down in front of a, in front of a nice computer. This isn't the CX Partners lab, but it's one. Oh, I don't know why I use this one, not a picture of us, but usually you sit down with people in front of a, in front of a computer and you record the screen, you chat to them, you record the audio, and boy, well, that's, that's about it. And everything I read about mobile testing was the same thing. It was like everybody was trying to recreate the experience of testing a, a desktop application, trying to record the screen really accurately. Uh, and that seemed, the, that seemed to be the entire goal uh, for them, was to, to get a picture of that screen and make the same thing. And I was just like, oh, hang on, well, that doesn't seem to be quite the quite the right thing as far as I'm concerned. I think there's, there are other things you want to know when you're testing a mobile. I don't go into great detail in this talk about testing out in the wild because I think it's an incredibly hard thing to do. As Raj pointed out, it's bloody hard uh, and I don't think anyone's really cracked it to be quite honest, although there's, there are people working on it, I know. This is, uh, this is how user testing mobiles m made me feel. You were in a lab. You're under a microscope. Um, and I thought to myself, actually, it's really about behaviours. Am I not here to understand why people are doing things rather than what they're looking at in minute detail? And I thought also, people are much more relaxed when they're using mobiles as well, uh, and iPads. Uh, much more relaxed, because they can be sitting anywhere. They could be outside. They could be sitting on a sofa. They could be doing anything. Uh, they're not sitting at a desk with a desktop. This is a very proper laboratory in Madrid, so it's very good. This is how people use mobile devices. Pop up on cats at home with a blanket and a cup of coffee. Nice, relaxed time. That, if I could get a mobile laboratory to look like that, and someone could come and sit, and sit with me for a day with a cat, I could have a CX partner's cat, and that would be approaching some sort of some sort of reality, the reality of testing, the reality of use of these things. Um, but we haven't quite got that. This is another picture. Flickr's amazing for pictures like this. Why would someone take a picture like that? And put it in the <laughs> I have no idea. But it suited my purposes perfectly well, because I've met, I've user tested with people uh, contextually and gone to their homes and tested with them. And this is what they do. So clearly she's sitting in front of the TV, got her remote controls, uh, and I've user tested uh, uh, holiday websites, and people do that. And it's not the only thing they do in front of the TV with a, with a mobile phone or a tablet. 
But they taught me all about that sort of stuff. And again, it's a really relaxed place to be. There's another story I had with a guy who was testing, who was using an iPad. He was 67 years old, and he said the iPad had transformed his life because he no longer had to sit in a chair and sit upright and sit in front of a, of a computer. He could relax in an armchair. His use of the internet had been transformed through having these things. Uh, and that's, that makes them a very, very different thing to test. And this was this argument. I was thinking, why are we trying to duplicate the mobile, duplicate the desktop recording and testing environment when actually people use these devices like this? This is my least favorite picture in the slide. Um, this is uh, our current cabinet, and that's, I hate him, but there you go. <laughs> but, <laughs> so it's not only a little bit of politics today. Um, but the fact is that all that testing, all that relaxed testing, all that not recording the screen accurately, super accurately, <coughs> that's fine for me as a, as a moderator of a test or for one of my colleagues who's moderating a test. But actually, we, we're not, someone else is paying for all the testing. And they like, as Raj pointed out too, they like to see. They like to see what's going on and they need to see it too because that's part of the part of the goal of the UX testing is that you take the clients along on that journey of going, look, what you've made is shit, we need to fix it. Uh, and if they don't see it, they don't like paying for it. So there are there are other people to think about in that in that sort of relationship of of, of testing. So sure we need to make it relaxed. In an ideal world it would just be me and a me and a participant and we'd sit and I'd observe stuff and I'd write a report or feed straight back into the development, uh, which does happen sometimes, but a lot of the time there's people coming along for the ride and they need to, they need to feel, that, uh, feel that too. So I'm going to move on to having a look at some of the sort of DIY equipment that I've, uh, that all six partners have used uh, broadly and that, that, that I've worked with six partners to sort of play with. Uh, over the last couple of years. Um, the first picture I'm going to show you is, um, this is really, uh, well, this was taken in about 2007, uh, and that's my colleague Steve, who actually made, he made this thing out of um, copper pipe, 15 mil copper pipe, and um, it collapsed so you could take it away uh, anywhere, and we were working with, there was no iPhone when we were testing these, this was with, um, I think the lot, the most up-to-date phone we tested on that was an N95, which was a pretty shit-hot phone, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a touch screen. Um, and we had DV cams, because we used to use DV cams when we were just using testing anyway. So we had them around the office. Uh, so we had DV cams on here, and this, it looks like a document camera. It's doing the same as a document camera, but uh, it's kind of made of stuff that we had lying around. At the time, uh, it was fine because phones were, yeah, sure, phones were, moved, were used all over the place, but because it wasn't touchscreen, there was, a, there was a phone and someone held it and they pressed, they used both thumbs or they used a thumb and they navigated around and they did, did small tasks. So this seemed to be perfectly sort of adequate sort of testing solution uh, to, to film what was going on. But I think the interesting thing was that even then in 2007, we weren't trying to put a rig on the phone or put the phone on a sled. We were trying to get an overview of what was going on. In fact, the equipment that Steve's using there, the DV cam and, and the wires and the, uh, and the way that we captured the, uh, captured the film is actually, I've got it on the table over here so we can have a look at it afterwards. Uh, still using it. It's the weird thing, still using exactly, not the frame, but still using exactly the same camera. Uh, what's that, five years on, uh, it's still perfectly useful. So these are some of the, uh, some of the sleds, and we've seen Mr. Tappy uh, already tonight. So this is a sort of the alternative approach. If you're not going to suspend a camera over somebody or suspend a camera over somebody's shoulder, uh, the, the commercial option uh, are out there. Uh, Mr. Tappy, um, I've got a different price for you, but it's not far off. Um, this was from Jeff Sarrow's site, um, measuring usability. So he's 
very clever man, does lots of amazing stuff, uh, and I look at his website a lot, but he charges $410 for his um, Mod 1000. Uh, it's still a sled. Uh, and then there's uh, Noldus, who are another US company, who are hugely uh, long-established company who produce equipment for measuring and uh, observing behavior in humans and animals. Uh, and they make this. They don't even tell you the price of their stuff. Um, on, the, on the website, you've got to, got to get in touch with them and talk to them before they'll even reveal the price. Uh, and it probably links into one of their hugely complicated pieces of software for measuring things. Uh, but they make it, and they make these things. Um, but I do have this sort of problem with this. So this is the one that I made, and I've brought this with me as well. Um, this is, if any of you have got kids, some of you might recognize Connex, uh, which is like plastic Meccano. Uh, and this is uh, a Nokia phone holder, which would usually get stuck to a windscreen in the car. So it's just been sort of hacked to pieces, taken to bits. Uh, and I've got brought this. It now features elastic bands as well, uh, as well as as well as a webcam now that it's fixed. And you can see the state of my painting in the kitchen as well, which is pretty rubbish too. And um, the neat thing about this was, because um, I looked at loads of stuff on the internet about making sleds for yourself, and there seemed to be this real problem about how do you attach the phone to the sled. There were lots of some people using blue tack or elastic bands. Uh, I think the problem's probably been solved now by the commercial guys. Wow, it's really tricky. You can't really. What can you do? Because the phone's stuck to it, and that's it. And we, when we test a lot of people, we ask them to bring their own phones in. If it's that type of thing, if it's a release app or it's a website, bring your own phone in. Because we don't don't want to test with something you're unfamiliar with using. So that was quite neat. I quite like the fact that this was uh, sprung loaded, so you could you could load any phone in it in seconds. Uh, and then the other neat thing is it's got a little, you can release it and spin it around so you can put it into a landscape as well. But I still don't like it very much. And um, the main problem I have with these um, is that using that one uh, and using it to test no matter, that's really light, and you'll find out, you'll be able to pick it up and you can see that it's really light, is it completely unbalances the way that you hold the phone and the way you use the phone. It's not the most elegant of things. Some of the more elegant ones will probably be nicer to use and less unbalancing. But the reality is that you have to hold the camera above the phone, and that completely changes the dynamics of using the phone. And I think if you're... Uh, if you're going to try and capture what people are really doing with the phone, that seems to be uh, counterintuitive. Because the, because the phone's on a sled, uh, it becomes very difficult to use the phone in a natural way as well. Google did some research, um, which I'll get the link for you. I think I've got it at the end of the slides. They did some research on mobile testing, testing lots of different ways of holding cameras over phones. And they, they came to the conclusion that um, they observed that people couldn't use the, they just couldn't use the phone in a natural way. Uh, so there's some reasonable research out there about, with reasonable numbers about actually it's not such a great idea. Um, there was a tendency for people to not want to pick the phone up when it was in one of these sleds, unless you handed it to them in the user testing. If you put it on the table and let, let them, there was a tendency for them to jab at, jab at the phone with a finger rather than picking it up and engaging with the phone. That made me feel better because my gut feeling was that it felt wrong. Um, and some other people, some other people felt it was wrong too, so that made me feel good. I'm sure there's some people who make think it's really good too, but I didn't look for their results. <laughs> that's that's proper research I thought too. As Raj said, there's the 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 alternative uh, document cameras. So this is a, a smaller one, but doing exactly the same thing as the as the one in the university. It's just like, well, yes, I, I like the idea of uh, document cameras. I like the idea that the camera's suspended over, over the uh, device. Um, and I completely agree that when it's being used, when the device is being used and it's being held underneath uh, a camera, you get this problem where someone gets excited, they move the phone out of the way. 
And I've had clients who have been uneasy with that fact that they lose, that they lose, lose valuable microseconds of video of the person's, uh, person on the uh, using the phone. But I think my feeling is that the benefit of having a camera suspended over, over the device is that they are able to use the device as freely as they possibly can. Uh, and losing a few seconds of video is they, maybe they tip the phone and you can't, you can't see the screen or, it, it, or you get a reflection on the screen or it goes dark as it tips away or they move it completely out of shot. I think that's in the grand scheme of things, in the grand scheme of an hour's testing, I think it's pretty irrelevant really against the natural interaction. So this is a picture of the setup. I've brought some of this with me. So this is a picture of a setup that we have at CX Partners. Um, so we've got a DV cam that's feeding into uh, an easy, an easy cam uh, convert, converts DV into USB, which is about all it does. Um, that's, it comes with its own software, so you can display um, what's happening up there uh, on the screen. Um, we've been using Silverback to, uh, to record, so we've been using the eyesight to do the, to do the uh, picture in picture which is fine. You get some walloping great files out of Silverback when it's uh, recording live video. It's, I, don't think it was, I don't think it was designed to do live video. Um, so it's useful, but it, you get these massive files to cope with. Um, but the, the software that comes with this EasyCat thing um, allows you to record this with, um, and that alone. So if you can cope without having a picture in picture at the end of it, then, then this is a, a nice solution and you get sensible sized files. Um, other little bits and pieces I've discovered along the way, um, uh, and I'm not a big camera buff or anything, so it's all a bit of a massive learning process. I put black sugar paper down on the table to cut down glare and reflection uh, when these are being used. Uh, every place I've ever tested seems to have white tables and you get this massive color balance between particularly with uh, phones with black, uh, black faces uh, and you get cameras can't cope, most cameras can't cope with that dramatic changes in white balance so, so well. So black sugar paper, um, a camera, a guy who knows his camera stuff suggested that there's a stuff called photographer's velvet apparently, it sounds a bit kinky, but there's a photographer's velvet which really cuts out all light, deadens it down completely. Uh, and deadens reflection, so uh, that's my next lit on the next list. Uh, and the other thing I use is on if it's my phone or the CX Partners phone that we're testing, then you use um, the anti-reflective, anti-glare sticky screens and put those onto the onto the screen of the phone to help stop the massive reflections of, of the lights in an office flicking down. All little things which help uh, get this picture uh, as good as possible, as much as possible. Um, and the neat thing about those DV cams, uh, as opposed to webcams, is that you can fix the focus. Uh, they've, got, they've got optical zoom, so you, get really, you can get in nice and close, but you can put the camera way away from, from the person. Uh, fixed focus, so you can fix the focus, bam, like that, so they're moving it. But actually, rather than the camera trying to, constantly trying to adjust its focus on the person's hand, they seem that bizarrely keen on focusing on flesh rather than on foams. So, uh, so fix the focus and you've got quite a nice little setup there for recording. This is some user picture through a, through a two-way mirror thing up in a research house, I think this is in London. Uh, lovely people, go there lots. Um, this was some mobile phone testing and, and iPad testing we were doing. And I thought this was, uh, apart from, the, we've moved on from using a webcam, but apart from this, I love the setup. It worked really, really nicely for the testing. Took away the big table in front of them, took away the monitors. They're sitting, it's my colleague Nick, uh, he's a participant, we're sitting around a coffee table. We've got a fairly discreet camera pointing down, uh, down there, and the user's happily sitting there, uh, leaning on his knees, 
using the phone, one hand, two hands, puts the phone down, picks the phone up, plays around, talks about what he's doing, and that was, uh, I think that was, we ran a couple of sessions like this uh, earlier this year, albeit experimentally, and I was really pleased with the results that came out of that, uh, about the naturalism about which they, with which the people use the phone. So I've kind of talked about sleds that I've made, and hanging cameras over people, and changing the setup and making it a bit more relaxed. One of the big problems I've had though is with the quality of the quality of the video. So my obsession is is increasing the quality of the of the video of the device. Given the fact that there's going to be some movement and you'll lose you lose some frames, it's like how do I how do I get a really fantastic, awesome picture of a screen here in someone's hand, but not have anything in in the way of the user. So it's so they don't know that there's a camera there, is my goal, I guess, is to, so they don't know there's a camera, they don't feel impeded in what they're doing, but we get an awesome shot. And the DV cab is about as close as I've got to that at the moment. Uh, and considering it's not even HDMI, it's an old, old AV one, it's, it's pretty cool. But there's a, there's a, there's a company, or well, there are a lot of companies, uh, who make really, really, really cool cameras um, called, um, God, now I can't remember what the bloody called there. Um, but the camera itself is, is this bit of this body here. They're tiny, absolutely tiny. Uh, and stuck inside there, they're, they're using the chips out of uh, DSLR cameras. So they've got huge CMOS chips or CDD chips inside these tiny, tiny cameras. You can screw on any lens you like, so you can do macro or micro or whatever you want. Machine vision cameras, that's what they're called, machine vision cameras. Uh, and this guy, this is a guy who's taken one of these cameras and made uh, a piece of software allied to a camera and a lens called Note Taker. And he used it, uh, he used it he's got um, poor vision in one eye and pretty restricted vision in another eye. Uh, to use in a lecture theatre so he can record a lecture and he, this camera will take a pin, pin sharp picture of a, of a chalkboard or a whiteboard in a lecture theatre and record it. He can make notes at the same time along with the video so it's in notes in sync with the video and it records audio which is in sync with the notes and in sync with the video. So you can pan and zoom the picture remotely from your, from your Mac, it's a Mac thing. And I just thought, this, I haven't got one of these, they're about $350, $400 or something. But I thought the, the, the potential of these machine vision cameras with these huge chips for taking amazing, amazing pictures, allied to clever man who's made super, super software, I just thought was, uh, that's my next step, basically. That's, that's my next goal, is to get one of these things get the right lens on it, suspend it from the ceiling, but be able to look at something on, on the tabletop or down at handheld height, but in pinch up detail. <coughs> that's what I want. But that's all, I guess, so far, everything I've spoken about has been about taking a picture of the camera, filming the camera. Um, but of course, there's the screen itself. You can mirror the screen. And uh, I think the interesting thing about talking about this is that in the space of time since I first wrote this, um, I first, first wrote this, which is a month ago I suppose I wrote this, uh, when I wrote this a month ago, the only, the only way that I could record a, a, an, a, an only an Apple uh, iOS screen, so not even Android or, or um, uh, WP7, the only way I could do it and see where people were touching the screen, so that was the, that was the killer bit, was to get, find out where they're uh, touching the screen, was to use this thing called Display Recorder, which is only for jailbroken phones. Which is fine if I'm testing a prototype and I've, I'm willing to jailbreak one of my phones, which I have done, and it's been, that's been a pretty crap experience, to be honest. And it kept crashing during the testing, so I didn't really like it. That was the only thing that was going out there. You could mirror the screens. Uh, as we said, with that, from the introduction of iPad 2, you could mirror, um, mirror through uh, VGA. Uh, and now you can mirror with 
what's it called? Mirror. Reflection. Thank you, reflection, yeah. So I've got a reflection slide in here somewhere. So you can mirror over a network as well. But those things you don't get to see when you're touching the screen. A colleague of mine went to UPA in Vegas and came back with a card for this, UX Recorder. Again, for iOS only, so many things seem to be. This will, when they release it, it's coming soon, still not released, uh, this will record the person, record the screens that the person's using, use the iSight camera, with a built-in camera on the phone to do a picture-in-picture -picture and record where they touch it as well. So that's in the space of a month I've learned, I've gone from jailbroken phones only to, to someone else's making software that's going to do this for me. Uh, and coming up here today, I was just thinking, looking at these screens and thinking to myself, that all, the, all the stuff, all, all, the, uh, all the work I've done over the last two years and uh, the uh, obsession of all this is going to be redundant soon. Totally redundant, because there will be software that will do it all for me. It won't take the picture, the suspended picture, I think there's still a, there's still a need for that. But actually recording the screens, everything else is going to be completely redundant, because they'll do it for you. This is another one, um, so if you're making apps for, uh, and this is iOS, but again, there'll be stuff out there for Android and WP7. If you're in a position where you're making them and developing them, then you can add this in as you develop. So it's not to do, you build it in during the development. Uh, release the app as a, as a beta, and it records everything that happens on the screen. And, and beams it back over the network. Um, you're supposed to take it off when you release it fully because it's, there are security implications with recording people entering passwords. But uh, when it's in beta, and people know that they're in beta, so that's it. So, you can, so there's apps you can add to phones to do it, to record screens. There are apps or, or there are kits that you can add in as you develop which I think is amazing. I've yet to work on a project like this, but I'd really like to, where we had that sort of data. So it's all becoming, yeah, incredibly redundant now. And I guess that brings me towards, a, I guess, a conclusion, some sort of a conclusion, is that um, there is this sense that there's, um, what, the way that you <coughs> test, or the equipment you use to test the phone, depends on, entirely on what you want to get out of the testing. And I suppose that's always true in whatever, in however you test something or whatever you test, is what you're after. And I guess the, what the, the, the level of sophistication in the stuff that we can do now allows us to be pretty good at doing things. And I guess it veers between, is it a deep understanding of what the person saw on the screen and what they read uh, and their comprehension of what they saw as they went through an app or a site on a mobile phone. In which case, recording the screen with one of those super, super lovely apps seems to be the right thing to do. Because you don't care, it's, it's, it's about what they read and, what they, and uh, their, their insights into what they're doing. Or is it about the loosely ergonomics, and I'm not I don't claim to know about ergonomics, but loosely about ergonomics. How easy is the thing to use? Have you put <coughs> the buttons in the right place? Can someone use it with one, one thumb while they're, while they're sitting at a coffee table? Um, is the button in the right place? Do they have to change position of the phone to do something? In which case, it's not the screen that you want to record. It's the context of the use. It's what they're doing with their hands. So there's just two sort of ends of a spectrum of, of what are you looking at and what are you trying to get out of that testing. So as I was saying before, I guess my perfect, I guess in my perfect world, um, I would have the Point, point Grey, that's the company, the Point Grey camera, some beautiful camera suspended miles above somebody but able to take pinch up pictures. Um, one of those lovely apps built into the phone so that I could record the screen at the same time. Um, and a lovely moderator sitting next to me. Um, 
and I'm still not convinced by sleds. I think we can dispose of them. Personally, I don't use them. Uh, and uh, I, don't think we, I don't think we'll need to as well. I've got some more sort of datary bits on the types of cameras and the software that I've been using. But I think that was uh, sort of, hopefully that sort of brought, drew together into sort of the main point that I wanted to make is that, um, that there's this sense of the spectrums of you understand what you want to test, understand what you need to get out of the testing, and then you can start to pick the, the most appropriate, appropriate measure or appropriate methods or of, uh, of recording that interaction. So has anyone got questions? Yeah, I think would you normally have in a sample and okay. let's say eight, three, four, four year olds as an example, how would you find those people generally? The minimum that we'll test with is about five people. And we we say that um, that that's enough basically that five people is enough to discover the majority of the problems. Um, that, a, that a, um, an app or a website might have. Um, and it's key that it's not about um, discovering where the problem, where it's not, dis it's not, it's not like a quantitative study of, of how bad it is or, or where the problems are, but why people are experiencing the problems. That's a joy of being, having two people sitting next to each other, having a conversation about it, so that you can understand sort of why, why is that a problem? Well, you wouldn't ask. I don't think I've ever asked anyone, why is that a problem? But that's the, that's the sense, is that you can dig into that, behave, into their behaviours and motivations of using things. Um, how I'd find them um, is, is, is even simpler, because I don't. I, I write a brief. I take a brief from a client, and they'll say, our, our key audience are 25 to 30-year-olds. They love music. Uh, they listen to, they stream music as they, as they sit on the bus. Uh, we want to talk to people like that. So I write a brief to that and I give it to a recruitment company who are all over the, all over the country. Uh, and the recruitment company goes and does all the hard work and finds the people for them. And they come back with screeners uh, and they say, do you like this person? They seem, to, they seem to be fitting in the right way and you can quiz them about that. If you want, you can go, mm, maybe that's not quite right. Well, they're just out of the age bracket, that's not good enough, but honestly, I, I, that's an incredibly time-consuming uh, element of my job, and I give it to somebody else to do. Another, com another, another company in time. Do <coughs> you imagine most people would just get, get their buddy in the and then go to a recruitment company? Sorry, say that again? Do you imagine that a lot of people would just get somebody in the some people in the office versus the recruitment company? I think that's uh, entirely fair. Is um, if you want to, to start at a low level, is to use people use people in the office, and um, that's what I describe. I guess is a very typical is a typical standard piece of user testing. But we just as likely we can go out and do guerrilla testing, which is a fancy name for going and um, button holding people in the street or a cafe and getting them to sit down for five minutes and test something. We've done it, we've done it in cafes. Uh, Bristol's blessed with a really lovely market, uh, covered market, which is a great place to go and uh, grab people for five minutes uh, and, and talk to them about using things. We've gone into uh, airports. Uh, we go to the massive International Bristol Airport and test, and test with people there. That's, pretty hard on the side where they're just dropping people off because everyone's in a hurry. But we've got a very good relationship with the airport and they let us go airside where people have got lots of time sitting around doing nothing. So if, they're, so if we're testing uh, travel related uh, websites, we go and talk to people who are traveling. So and we, that's kind of, that's doing our recruitment for us. It's, it's pinning down people who are thinking about traveling already. I think we've got time for one more question. So, so when you set up, you've got CX, um, your idea set up. Do you not find that people got distracted by the laptop in front of them when they're using them? I was just thinking, if you're trying to do yeah. that sort of stuff. Is it? Um, it's a fair point. I, it, I, don't know, I don't honestly know the answer of, of whether they did or didn't. Um, the, the way we try and uh, minimise the distraction is that we just blank, we blank the screen out and we turn it. We, so there's nothing... There's nothing happening on the screen in front of them whilst they're doing the test. Although it's recording and mirror, mirroring its image, uh, they can't see anything. So, yes, there is a laptop in front of them, but 
yeah, they can't, they, there's nothing going, there's, there's no picture of them, which would, well, that would be weird. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you.